Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Ashley, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, pen, and paper, your phone, however you want to take notes, and get ready for today's message. We're in a series called The Armor of God, and I'm just going to tell you right off the bat, today's topic, today's sermon title is this, pull your pants up. Pull your pants up. Now listen, I'm all about, like, I, I like baggy pants, baggy clothes culture, but what I don't like is seeing your drawers, right? When you got your underwear all hanging out, especially when you're trying to wear tidy whities and your underwear is a see-through, pull your pants up. Pull your pants up. <laughs> Talking about the armor of God. What do you think the armor of God has to do with pulling your pants up? Well, let's take a look. Our key passage is Ephesians 6.10. Someone came up to me after first service like, yo, when you start talking about baggy pants and all that, I was about to zone you out. And then your sermon got good. I was like, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> Ephesians 6.10 says this. It's the uh, last chapter of Ephesians, it says, finally, my brethren, finally, because I'm closing it out, here's my last thought. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the tricks, the temptations, the attacks. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, said twice, that you, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand, it's talking about when you got rocked in the jaw, and you kind of just, whoa, that was harsh. Just keep standing. Get back up. Keep standing. Stand, therefore, having gird your waist with truth. It says, put a belt on. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, which is... the. Um, which is you are able to quench every fiery dart of the wicked one and put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, Paul is saying this, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in, I, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that as we dive into the scripture and pull it apart, I pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding, enlighten us to your truth, show us things to come, speak to our hearts in a new and living way, in Jesus' name, amen. Before we start looking at the first piece of armor, I pointed out that there's a sentence that appears twice that's kind of strange. He says, put on the whole armor of God. He says it twice. Now... Did anybody have to tell you today to put on your whole outfit? Huh? Did anybody have to tell you, hey, before you get dressed, make sure you put your undies on? Huh? Hey, before you walk out the house, put your sneakers on. Did anybody have to tell you that? No, because when you get dressed, you're going to put on your whole outfit. So is he telling us that it's possible to not put on the whole armor of God? Or could there be some kind of other meaning behind him saying, we need the whole armor. We need the whole truth. And it took me some time to study this out because I believe there might be. There's another passage that Paul wrote in which he addresses a couple pieces of the armor, but not the whole armor. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8, Paul says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, interesting. 1 Thessalonians is the oldest book of the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians was written by Paul first. It was written in A.D. 50. A.D. 50. 
Ephesians doesn't come along until AD 60 or AD 61. So 10 to 11 years later, Paul then writes Ephesians. What does this show us? This shows us that Paul, over the last 10 to 11 years, has grown in his knowledge. He has grown in his understanding. He has grown in wisdom. He has a closer relationship with God. God has revealed new information to him. He has new word. He has new rhema. He has new insight. And this is one of the problems with church. People want to hold pastors accountable to something they preached 20 years ago. That was a 20-year-old revelation. That was a meal for 20 years ago. But we need daily bread. We need new revelation. We need new knowledge. We need new understanding. But that's not what I was taught as a kid. Well, hopefully you learn new stuff. Hopefully you went from riding a bicycle to learning how to drive a car. Huh? Because if not, that's a cold bike ride right now outside. You're cold. All right? Hopefully, you learn new things as you grow. And Paul is saying, there was, I, I once had some understanding of the armor of God, but now I have the whole revelation. I have the whole knowledge. I have the fullness. So put on the full armor of God. And here it is. Before, I knew about some of it. Now I know about all of it. Here's the full list of the armor of God. And, and I think that's where we kind of get stuck with this idea of armor of God. I got to make sure that I put all of it on every single day. You know what's funny? There's not a single passage in the entire Bible that says the armor comes off. There's not a single passage that says, okay, now when you go to bed, take off the whole armor of God so that you may be able to rest without clickety-clankety all night. <laughs> it doesn't say it, right? Because once you put it on, it's on. It's on you. You are clothed in righteousness, right? You were covered in the blood of Jesus. All right, we're going to look at this. We're going to get here. So... He says, put on the full armor of God. Let's look at the first piece of armor. He says, put on the belt of truth. Put on the belt of truth. I got a problem with this. I got a problem with this. Because out of all the flashy pieces of armor and weaponry, he wants to talk about a belt. Belts aren't cool. Even a Gucci belt ain't cool. It ain't cool. Not when, not when the Roman soldier's helmet had jewels and gems and ornate things on that one. Their shin guards had diamonds and emeralds on their shin guards. I mean, that's some cool stuff. Let's talk about the sword, right? I mean, he says, put on a belt. Listen, I got to tell you something. I've been preaching for 20, over 20-something 20 years. Ain't nobody ever come up to me after one of my sermons and says, but Pastor Mike, that belt though, that belt that you had on, that belt was fire. That belt, even when I used to wear a white belt, like, you know, with like the big belt buckle and all that, nobody ever said, yo, your belt, that was, that's what I'm talking about. Now, people have said, yo, your sneakers or your jacket or your shirt or that beard. <laughs> but never my belt. Especially if you got a little extra weight in the midsection, nobody's seen it anyway. <laughs> God Almighty, through the unction of Paul, decides to list a belt first. It's kind of boring. It's kind of boring. And when you find out what the belt is, it kind of makes a little bit of sense that it's boring. Because a lot of Christians are bored by it. They're bored by their belt. Even when you buy a belt to match your shoes, it's still not all that impressive. You still get kind of tired of it over time. 
But what we got to understand is that if a Roman soldier didn't have a belt, everything would fall apart. Everything would fall apart. Come on, you seen those videos on YouTube where some dude is at a wedding and didn't put his belt on and he's dancing and all of a sudden, woof, his drawers drop to the floor, right? How embarrassing! Because when you don't have a belt on, you're kind of all disheveled and, yo, you ever... God's going to have to forgive me for about to where I'm about to go with this. I was a youth pastor for 12 years, and one of the things that I enjoyed doing was playing basketball with the kids in my city. I wasn't very good at it. White boy can't jump. I couldn't even get inside. They would stuff me all the time. But what I could do is I could Larry Bird the tar out of those kids, put me on the three-point line, whew, you know, all day threes from the outside. But anyway, I played basketball with a bunch of kids from the streets. These kids were 29-inch waist, buying 36-inch pants, right? So all I had to do is dribble to their weak side because their weak side was holding their pants up. <laughs> Come on, you've seen it. You've seen it because when you don't got the belt on, you lose confidence. You're not put together. You're not structured. And that's precisely what the belt did for a Roman soldier. It held every piece of armor together. He might have had all the greatest, coolest weapons, but if he didn't have a belt on, he had no place for it to hold it together and it would fall apart. That's why the belt is the most vital part of all the armor of God. It is the most vital part of all the armor of God, and that's why it's listed first. The Roman soldier's shield of faith, when he wasn't using it, would mount on his belt. The sword housed in the belt. The lance of prayer in the belt. The breastplate of righteousness tucked behind the belt. Every piece of armor fitted perfectly, held tightly by the belt. The soldier's armor would literally fall apart piece by piece if the belt wasn't in place. And that's why Paul says here in Ephesians 6.14, stand therefore, stand therefore in confidence, having your loins girt about with truth. Understand this. Understand why it's the first one and why it's the most important. It is the only piece of the entire armor that has been translated from the spiritual realm into the physical realm. Right. You can't show me the sword of the spirit. You can't show me a shield of faith. You can't show me a breastplate of righteousness. You can't show me your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You can't show me your helmet of salvation. But you can show me the belt of truth, which is the word of God, yeah. the Bible. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. A couple verses down. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and then we were given the written Word of God, the Logos. We were given the written Word of God. The belt of truth is the written Word of God. It is the only piece of armor that we possess in our hands as a tangible item from God. But just like a belt ain't all that flashy, reading your Bible can be kind of boring. It could be kind of boring. It could be kind of like, I know I'm supposed to do that. But like I tried it a couple times and it's like I didn't get anything out of it. It used these words like thus and thee and thou and thy and didn't really know what they meant. It can be kind of boring. And just like 80% of us in here today don't have a belt on, 80% of Christians never reach for their Bible. That's why we're sagging. That's why we're sagging in life as believers, trying to run the race that's set before us. But we're sagging. We're sagging because we don't know what the truth is. 
We don't know that. If God is for us, who can be against us? What shall man do unto me? Oh, that's a Bible verse? Yeah, it's in your belt. It's in your belt. It's in your belt. See, but that's not truth to you because you don't got that belt on. I'm not putting anybody down. This is not a judgment sermon. We're talking about the armor of God. We're talking about why it feels like we can't stand when attacks come. We ain't clothed. We ain't got the belt. We ain't got the belt. I can't speak truth that I don't know is mine. And God is making a point here. He's saying that the piece of armor that is in the middle of the man and the woman of God is the most important piece. The Bible. The Bible is the most important piece of your entire armor, and without it, your life falls apart. This is the struggle of Christians. Why is everything so hard? Why is this difficult? You don't got the, you don't got the word. We're not putting the word in every day. We're putting a want in, but not the word in. We're putting prayer requests in, but we don't know what Scripture says. This is why the Christian church is dying in America. It's not because God's word isn't true. It's not because God doesn't want to do signs and wonders and miracles. It's Christians just don't want to read the Bible. More access to Scripture than ever before. Less involvement. Less involvement with Scripture. Listen, this is not a pop out. This is not me judging anybody. I'm just looking at the armor of God. And we're going to say, hey, don't even talk to me about your breastplate of righteousness or your shield of faith or your sword of the spirit, and you ain't got the belt on. Yeah, but let's get to the cool stuff. Let's talk about the sword of the spirit. Listen, the sword of the spirit does not become a sword until it is spoken properly in alignment with the belt. The sword of the spirit is not simply the Bible. The sword of the spirit is when you speak it. That's what activates truth to weaponry. And when you speak it in accordance to how it is supposed to be applied, it becomes a two-edged sword dividing even a sunder joint and marrow. Dude, until that point, you could say all day long, you could be quoting scripture all day long, but it's just sitting right there. You can't be quoting a healing verse over your finances. It don't work. It's got to be correctly applied. Believers, when believers don't know the word, they get destroyed for a lack of knowledge. The Bible doesn't say, for my people are destroyed for lack of access to me. He said, for my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But you, but you, but you got the belt. But you, but you got it. You own it. And your belt is either on the back of your toilet or on your nightstand or on a bookshelf. And you probably got a couple of them. We're great at collecting belts. We're great at collecting Bibles. You got a leatherback Bible. You got a paperback Bible. You got a KJV, NKJV, NIV, NLT, AMP, OG. OG's not original gangster, it's original gospel. <laughs> OPP. We got them. We own them. Doggone if we don't know what's actually in them. I'm just, I'm just talking about why we're sagging in warfare. Why it's hard to live out the gospel because we don't know. We don't know about the belt. I do feel that I need to point out that in reading Scripture, there's two things that are going to happen. There's two types of words that come from God. There's the logos or the logos, however you want to say it, which is the written word of God. And then there's the rhema, which is the revealed word of God. We have the logos and the rhema. Logos. Here's what happens. All of us love rhema. Because rhema is the flashy one. That's when you read the scripture, bam, something jumps out. It's revealed. You get a revelation, revelation knowledge. Whoa, that scripture just spoke to me. It said something. And that's exciting. But you ain't going to get a rhema every single time you read the Logos. 
And that's why it gets boring. Like, you know, it's just like I'm in a routine. I just feel like I'm in a rut. Well, then believe for those rhema moments when the logos becomes something, it speaks to you, and let it fuel you till you get your next rhema. When all else fails, your Bible's within arm's reach, whether in your house or in your pocket. You can download a Bible app. And chances are, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you have all sorts of Bibles. You might even have a little pretty uh, Bible cover with your name embroidered on it. But just because you possess them doesn't mean you know how to use them. And it becomes easy, listen to me, it becomes easy to lose appreciation for the Word of God. For the Word of God. Please don't take for granted that you go to a Bible church, a word church that preaches the word. Don't, don't use that as, well, I got some word for the week. Well, I mean, you had dinner yesterday. You're going to go four days without it, five days without more dinner? No, man, you got to feed yourself. Feed yourself. Uh, can, can I just tell you something? It's a saying here at Family Church. Only babies cry when they're hungry. Adults get up and make a sandwich. Right? I had to leave my last church because I wasn't being fed. Feed yourself. Feed yourself. Get yourself up. Go get your Bible off the toilet seat and bring it back. Get, get, get a word. Get, get some gospel in you, right? There's many translations. If you don't understand KJV, then get a translation that you do understand. Here's the deal. Know, though that some translations of Bible have a slight slant based upon which denomination the writer is part of. Okay, so there are some things that words and phrases are a little bit different in translations. It does not nullify the power of the gospel. It's just a slant in which that person viewed those scriptures, okay? But let's talk about this. How important is the belt of truth? How important is the word of God? If you lay your Bible aside... In time, you'll begin to lose a sense of righteousness. Now, I did not say that you become unrighteous. You will lose a sense of a relationship with God. You'll be sitting back like, man, I, why do I feel so far from God? Well, man, because you're sagging. Sagging, you've got your belt on. Get some word. Listen to what I'm saying. Listen, when you don't have the belt on, you lose a sense of your righteousness. When you lay the belt of truth aside, you slowly begin to lose a sense of peace. When you lay the belt aside, you begin to lose and, and feel the joy of your salvation leaving. If you toss the belt of truth aside very quickly, you, be, you begin to lose faith in God. When the belt is off... All the other armor gets dishuffled. You absolutely cannot function properly as a believer in Jesus Christ without the word of God being an active, central part of your life. You just can't. You just can't. You may run a little bit on the steam of the past. You may run on a revelation that, that someone preached or a really good sermon or a really good worship night, but eventually you're going to run out of steam. You're going to run out of knowledge. I went to seminary, and I, and, I, and I learned a lot, and I preached everything I knew the first year of pastoring. I had to get more knowledge. I had to get more information. If you remove the belt from your life, it's only a matter of time until you begin to fall to pieces spiritually. Demonic assaults will break through that invisible barrier that used to protect you. And things begin to affect your life. I would hope that you want to have a successful spiritual life. And the only way is to pull your pants up and to put your belt on. What happens when you do that? What happens when you put the belt of truth in its proper place? Paul wrote to us in 2 Timothy 3.16, he says, For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So scripture, 
the word is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. For what cause? What happens? That the man of God or the woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto good works. If good things aren't happening in your life, you might not have the word in the right place. This is the outcome of, above all, put on the belt of truth. Put on the belt of truth. Put it in its proper place. Can I, can I talk to some, some people who, or maybe you're watching online, maybe some other ministers from other churches are, are, are watching today. Hey, listen, you can fake the funk for a little bit. You can download someone else's sermon for a little bit. You can copy what someone else wrote in a book for a little bit. But if you don't have the word in your life, you're going to be a problem. You're going to be a problem. It transforms, the word transforms the normal individual into a perfected, thoroughly furnished man or woman of God doing good works by putting the belt on. Did you think that we could go an entire half hour message talking about a belt? How boring. How boring. But can I ask you this? Maybe you're one of those people who got a stack of Bibles. Got all different kinds. Different translations. Could you think back for a minute why you bought that extra Bible? Why'd you buy that another one? Maybe you're like my dad. My dad, if my dad, so my dad was really into dress shoes. I'm into sneakers. My dad, when he would go buy dress shoes, he would buy the matching belt. The belt to match the shoes. And my dad would tell me, son, you ain't put together until the belt matches the shoes. And I'd say, huh, I ain't wear a belt. <laughs> Got him. But could you remember back why you bought that Bible? You, went, you had a KJV, but now you bought an NIV. Maybe you bought that Bible for a special occasion, a special purpose, a special study that you were doing. Just like my dad would buy a special belt to match the special shoes for a special occasion, maybe you bought a Bible, a different type of Bible, to learn something new, and maybe you've lost that excitement. You lost that drive. At once you were cross-referencing different scriptures and trying to find different truths and studying out a topic, but now it's just kind of like stale, like I'll download a version Bible app and read a scripture for the day. And guess what happens? We get stuck living a mediocre spiritual, mediocre spiritual life because we ain't putting a belt on. The belt holds it all together. Now, maybe you're here today and you're like, you know, I, I've never put any of the armor on because I, I don't know God. So do me a favor. Let's say you've never read the Bible. Maybe you're a first-time guest. Maybe you're really new to church. Like, I applaud you for even walking in the doors today. I beg you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, do not start in the book of Genesis. Do not start in Leviticus. Do not start in Numbers. Don't even start in Matthew. You ain't going to get through the second chapter, begot, begot who, and then begot who, and then begot who, and begot who. It ain't just going to happen. What I would love, don't even start in the book of John. Like, the book of John is great. I used to tell people to read the book of John because it talks about the life of Jesus, and you get all that story in the background of Jesus. But I would say start in the book of Acts. The Acts of the Apostles, the beginning of the modern church. If, if, if modern church operated a little bit like the Acts 2 church, we, we wouldn't have to worry about seeing revival. Oh my gosh. We, cannot, we need revival. We need signs, wonders, and miracles. Yeah, but you don't even read your Bible. How lazy are we? God, have revival. He said, I would love to, but know what you're quoting. Yeah. Revival means to bring back to life. 
How about we start a revival by bringing back to life our hunger for the Word of God? A hunger for knowledge and understanding and His Spirit speaking life into us. We do that, we will be a catalyst for revival. We will have to ask for revival. We will be revival. We will be it. We'll have words of knowledge and wisdom and prophecy and understanding happening all the time because He's revealing it to us through His logos. We're getting rhemas as we read the logos, and now we're sharing it with others, and we have revival in our jobs and in our homes. It ain't about Pastor Chris shaking his booty the right way to get revival. It ain't about having Spanish or English to have revival. It's about a bunch of us getting our priorities straight, putting the belt on, giving it its proper place. Jesus Christ, the Son of God Almighty, died on the cross a horrific, torturous death just to deliver the gospel to you, just to give you a word. It ain't sexy. It ain't pretty. It ain't flashy. It ain't the coolest piece of armor, but it'll save your life. It'll save your life. It'll save you from destruction. It'll save you from self-destruction. Because we get scriptures like, he who keeps his mouth keeps his life and keeps himself from destruction. A soft answer turns away wrath. When we get the scriptures flowing, it brings the wholeness of who we are together. If you're here today or watching online, and you've never even begun this journey because you don't know Jesus, I want to introduce you to my best friend. The, the, the reason why I can worship as passionately as I do and I can preach as passionately as I do is not because I'm perfect. The exact opposite, because I'm broken. That I have to have a Savior. That without Jesus Christ, I'd be a hot mess. Without the, without the belt of truth in its proper place, I'd be sagging so bad I'd trip over myself all day long. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're watching online and you're like, man, I need something. I need a difference. Maybe there's someone online and you're watching online because you've become so depressed that you've shut yourself in. You're secluded, isolated. I pray right now that this message, what I'm saying right now, is permeating through the internet to your house. And that heaviness, that spirit of heaviness is falling off in the name of Jesus. That the depressive spirit is leaving your body and your mind would come clarity and that there would be a joy returning to your life. That you'd open your doors to the, to the community again and people could help bring hope and healing into your life. Somebody else watching online and you're going through some legal battles right now and you're afraid. I'll tell you this right now. Don't let the spirit of fear grab a hold of you. God's not giving you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I pray that you would reach out to Family Church, that we could connect with you, bring hope to who you are and what's happening in your life. If you're here watching online and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you don't have that relationship with him, I would ask you to join with this body of believers. And pray this salvation prayer. The Bible says that we are to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. With the heart, we believe unto salvation. But with the mouth, confession is made. And so we do that by praying a prayer. We pray it together corporately. But first, there has to be that heart that says, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. When we believe that, when we believe that, we put him in the proper place. We put him in the priority place of our lives. Lord means Lord of all or not at all. Lord. If you're here today or watching online, you need to pray that prayer with us. We'd like to pray it with you. And it goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me, in Jesus' name, amen, amen.
If you prayed that prayer for the first time watching online, would you type amen or the little hands up button in one of our chat rooms? One of our online hosts would love to connect with you and send you our six-day devotional called Starting Point. If you're in the room today and you prayed that prayer today, would you allow me the honor of celebrating you for two seconds? Would you just wave at me and say, hey, Pastor Mike, that was me. I prayed that today. Anybody all real quick so I can celebrate you? I can't really. Oh, yeah, I see you. Yeah, I see you. Anybody else? Real quick, yeah, I see you. Awesome, yeah, I see you. Woo! Yeah! All right. All right, yeah, little man. Go ahead, stand up on your chair, little man. Right there, I see you, little man. Awesome. That same book, uh, Starting Point, is available to any of you who are interested in having that. One of our ushers or our care team members have that available. If you came here today and you need prayer for any reason, you need someone just to put hands on you and pray with you, we will have care team members available at the front of the room here. If you're going through something in your life and you need to speak to somebody, you need spiritual counseling, would you reach out to our church office? We have a team of counselors available to you at your disposal for that. If you're interested in furthering your education, um, either a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, would you stop at our college table in the back? Uh, our hope and our prayer is that Family Church would be a resource to the community to continue to move life forward in a healthy way. If you're feeling in your life that you're not healthy right now spiritually, reach out to somebody. Don't do life alone. Don't do community alone. Connect with somebody. If you've been struggling with addiction or you've been struggling with a bad attitude or you've been struggling with anger, Thursday nights we have a great program called Celebrate Recovery right here at Family Church. It is by far the best weekly Bible study that we have in any of our programs. So, so come on out Saturday night at, uh, Thursday night at 7 p.m. Father, we thank you and praise you that your word will never return void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. Lord, I thank you for speaking to us today, for encouraging us and loving us the way that you do. I thank you that everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love ya. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor Josh, and if this message has impacted you in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a few things. First, I would love if you would subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 and 11.30 a.m. Second thing is, I'm gonna ask that you would take a next step on your journey, and we'd love to help you do that. You can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today. Have a great rest of your day.